This podcast is recorded on stolen and unceded Aboriginal land. We acknowledge the First Nations and elders of this country and we join their calls for justice. Well, I was just reading this piece called Fighting Fit. Image Consultant Reveals How Leaders Prepare for the Poll by private Sydney columnist Andrew Hornery. Now, I know you shouldn't make fun of people's (laughs) names, Emerald Moon, but I think if if a guy's name is Andrew Hornery, then you're allowed to laugh at that. That's okay. Yeah, Emerald Moon is better than that. I think so. Between Labor leader Anthony Albanese's hip new spectacles, sharper suits, oversized Akubra and 15 kilogram weight loss, and Prime Minister Scott Morrison's white thongs, fish curries, curiously thicker hairline, it would appear the image makers are well into campaign mode ahead of the next federal election. Yeah, I personally, I asked the weight and measurements of all of my political candidates at the, <laughs> the voting booth. And I, I will not vote until they tell me. Now check this out. I signed a 30-page non-disclosure contract that still binds me today. One stylist who has worked on successful election campaigns informed me last week. No still too nervous to be named. Holy shit. Okay, that's wild. That's amazing. 30-page non-disclosure contract if you told Tony Abbott to look less like a lizard okay. or told Bill Shorten to lose some weight or to go running. Unnamed source, our DMs are open. <laughs> Like just make a burner account, yes. send us through this this contract because it would just be such golden content. Emerald has committed to covering all your legal fees if you do reach out. We discuss this further. Uh, yep. Our current Prime Minister is often posing in the Kiribilli kitchen, as he did most recently, making a New Year fish curry. Back in 2005, I inadvertently ignited a storm of controversy after writing about Julie Gillard's bare fruit bowl sitting in her eerily lifeless kitchen when she posed for photographers at home ahead of becoming Labor leader and ultimately PM. I was also echoing what many readers were saying about that image, a rare glimpse into the private domain of a political leader. At the time, as I pondered why Australia's first potential female prime minister would be located in her kitchen for the photo shoot at all. Okay. Yeah. So he was doing feminism yeah. by saying, well, we shouldn't be seeing this woman in the kitchen. Yeah. But also, why is this woman's fruit bowl so, <laughs> so empty? I've never been in a kitchen because I'm a real feminist. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get any styling advice when you were a Greens candidate? Maybe I should have. Maybe I would have beat Andrew Lamming if I had this this guy. Well, if you look too good, I think Andrew Lamming might um, might have paid you more attention, you know? Yeah, true. Yeah. Allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> Can I just say, uh, on, on, on the measure of extremities, the most extreme political movement on offer in this election is the Greens. The Greens are far more extreme than Clive Palmer or One Nation. Frankly, I've always found the Greens to be a real serious danger to Australia. <laughs> serious danger to Australia. Hello and welcome, Akuba wearers, uh, Horner and Glasses wearers, and everyone in between. <laughs> <laughs> This is Serious Danger, a podcast about green politics in Australia. My name's Emerald Moon. Hi, Tom. This is Tom Ballard. Hello, Emerald. It's me, Tom Ballard. Hi, everyone. Hi. This is not, before we get into it, this is not an official Greens Party podcast. Mm -hmm. We talk about things, but we are not the Greens. We're Greens members. Please send all your points to us and not to them. (laughs) (laughs) Um, This week, we are talking a little bit, mostly, you know, a couple of COVID things. We're talking about Novak Djokovic. We're discussing um, Hillsong parties and double standards when it comes to COVID regulations. And we'll be chatting to a rente woman, trade unionist, writer, activist, and Greens candidate for Cooper, Celeste Little. Yay. About a bunch of cool things. She's fantastic. So that's very exciting. Well, we're going to be telling her off for running in a Labor held seat against a progressive Labor woman, which is bad. She was good until she announced her candidacy. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get into it, we wanted to ask friends. We're thinking next episode of doing an Ask Me Anything. AMA. We've hit we've hit the bottom of the barrel. We've got nothing else to say. This is when podcasts get desperate. Yeah. Uh, But if there is something that you want to know, please DM us or email us. You can email us, what is it? Hello at seriousdangerpod.com. That's right. Or just send us a message on Instagram or Twitter. We're at seriousdangerau. But yeah, anything that, you know, you want us to kind of address on the show, whether it's about us or the show or kind of the Greens movement and the the election, what other things can people ask about, Tom? Styling tips, obviously. Styling that's, tips. That's big. How do we do it? How yeah. do we manage to keep so hot and so left wing at all times? Is Emerald free on Friday night for dinner <laughs> and a movie? Things like that, maybe. 
Do you know Andrew Hornery? These are questions <laughs> that we could answer to. But yeah, you know, we figured we've been going, we're almost in the double digits, digits of episodes um, and we're so stoked. There are so many patrons and people checking out the show and sharing it. It's very, very cool. And we'd love to get some direction from you guys, stuff that you want us to touch on or questions that you have about us and our relationship to the party or about the show. Anything at all, we are open books. Emails hello at seriousdangerpod.com. Whatever way you look at it, Novak Djokovic is a lying, sneaky yes. He's an asshole. asshole. He is an asshole. <laughs> did we, did they, did they do the right thing by him? I don't know. No, I don't. I, I don't. They fucked it up. All right, let's talk Novaks, baby. Novaks. Uh, everyone's been talking about Novak Djokovic this week. The Serbian world tennis number one, renowned vaccine skeptic and former COVID-19 patient received a visa in November of last year to come to Australia for this year's Australian Open. That's a little bit weird. He's not double vaccinated, mm. but he managed to get a medical exemption approved by Tennis Australia's chief medical officer and a Victorian government independent expert panel. We don't know what that exemption was. Uh, some would say that because he had... COVID-19, that was his exemption, but no. then the government is saying that if you're unvaccinated, having had COVID-19 in the past six months does not get you out of quarantine if you were to come to Australia. But anyway, got an exemption, got the visa, arrived in Australia on January the 5th, Border Force apparently fucked him around a little bit, cancelled his visa, he was put into immigration detention in the Park Hotel in Carlton, Melbourne, for four nights, four gruelling nights. Four nights. Uh, there was outrage. There were vigils outside his hotel. His dad, he compared his treatment to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It was everywhere. I'm sure people across crossed these details. Then a court overturned that cancellation of the visa, said he was fine. He was granted visa. We heard some more details about some inaccuracies he made on his travel documents. And we also learned that apparently when Novak Djokovic has COVID, he doesn't give a fuck and will happily lick children, um, <laughs> go to all the events. The twists and turns. One day when he was he tested positive in December last year, he knew he was positive and he still went to his tennis centre in Belgrade to uphold a long-standing commitment for a Le Equip interview because he <laughs> felt obliged and didn't want to let the journalist down. You can't let journalists down. Emma. Oh, I hate it when I let a journalist down. They've never <laughs> let me down. <laughs> no, they're always helping you. <laughs> so, so I think like public opinions turned against him a little bit on that front. And now at the time of recording, we still don't know what Immigration Minister Alex Ahawk is going to do. The power is vested in him. He could cancel Djokovic's visa again on sort of a character grounds or the idea that he's some kind of public health risk. And even if that visa cancellation does happen, which probably you'll know about by the time this podcast comes out, there'll still be an appeal process. So it will still mm -hmm. continue and uh, carry on. It's been a wild saga that the media has been ending up like crazy and obviously lots of people are very much invested. He's a very popular tennis player and brings up a whole lot of questions about borders and COVID-19 and such. Mm -hmm. What has been your your Novak take this week, Emerald? I'm still on a holiday, so I'm still not paying a whole lot of attention. But I feel like <laughs> my take, it's, I mean, people love a COVID villain. People, yes. like since the beginning of the pandemic or perhaps since, you know, more strict regulations came into place and yeah people love finding someone who has broken them and just like they fucking hate that person and that's what the news is yes. about for you know weeks um i'm sure i think with Djokovic, it's justified because he's rich and i i hate him because he's rich probably <laughs> more than i hate him for for everything else but yes. even with the kind of vitriol that he has experienced I still think that it's like the real world consequences for him will be less than we would have seen for, for example, the like two young women of colour that crossed into Queensland. Folks might remember it's years ago now. Right. Um, but, yeah, had their faces plastered on the front of what was it, the Courier or the, the Daily Telegraph um, and basically doxxed and face charges and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Look, I think it's one of those things where you can hate a variety of different people. Everybody sucks. Um <laughs> Novak Djokovic is definitely wrong. He's on yes. the record as having some pretty wacky anti-science positions. In his autobiography, Serve to Win, about watching a test in which a researcher directed loving energy towards one glass of water and swore aggressively at the other. After a few days, he wrote, the belittled glass was tinted slightly green. The other glass was still bright and crystal clear. Oh, my God, I've <laughs> so heard of this water theory. Yeah, yeah. 
apparently that's his water theory. If you yell and swear at a, a glass of water, then it, of water it will change theory. color. Mm-hmm. Uh, in April 2020, he said pretty much explicitly he was opposed to vaccination and he was curious about well-being and how we can empower our metabolism to be in the best shape to defend metabolism. against imposters like COVID-19. It, oh, okay. So, look, I mean, I know there are a variety of opinions, but for me, the COVID vaccine is safe and very effective and Novak Djokovic has an extraordinary, huge, influential platform and one would like to see. He should, yeah. He's definitely wrong. Would like to see someone like him shut the fuck up, stop being a baby, take the vaccine like the rest of us and get on with your life. As Josh Butler tweeted, if I was Novak Djokovic, I would simply have taken two doses of the safe and effective COVID-19 vaccinations, then quietly collected my millions of dollars for playing tennis. Exactly. <laughs> That's what I mean. Like, it's probably the best option. But it's like, yeah. okay, man, if you don't if you don't want the vaccine, then you don't get the exemption, okay, because clearly that's been some, some dodgy um, on some dodgy ground. So Djokovic sucks. He should have got the vaccine. Tennis Australia sucks by trying to get him this exemption. And everyone who tries to get an exemption for the rich and powerful, which has happened throughout the entire pandemic, you know, there was, there was some representation that, hey, rules are rules, all right, and everybody's been treated the same and Djokovic is not going to get an exemption. It's like, fuck you. Them's the rules. From the get-go. Yeah. Rich Hollywood actors arriving in Australia able to pay for their own quarantine mm-hmm. and quarantine at home because they could pay for the security. There was San- The boss of Santos was crossing the WA border all the time and not having to quarantine because he was allowed to go out to mining sites and just check in and not shake too many hands or whatever and he'd be totally fine. And if people remember, in August 2020, there was a Sydney businessman who got a travel exemption to go to Europe to pick up his luxury yacht, right? This was crucial yeah. travel that he had to undertake during a pandemic. And the government said, yeah, that's that's totally fine. Even that's the no way worries. the rules were structured, the fact that you could cross a border to buy property, like this right. is what, you know, what's considered essential. <laughs> like, yeah. So that's fine. But, of course, the real villain that we should focus on is the fact that Australia is insane when it comes to borders and the border regime that yes. we impose on all sorts of migrants, people who are who are coming um, for a holiday to work or what have you, uh, as best up on a whole bunch of different fronts or, or, in this case, for a certain visa exemption for a specific purpose. But, of course, most notably is people who come to this country seeking a better life, seeking safety, fleeing from people that we've like waged war on as a country apparently um and we will pop you into a detention facility forever which is one of the political elements that came out of the Djokovic story as well right he was in the park hotel in Mm -hmm. Carlton in that very same hotel are a bunch of people who have been there for a very very long time or been in Australian immigration detention for a very very long time yeah because they had the temerity to arrive in this country by boat and that's the worst possible thing that you can do yeah absolutely here's one of those people right this is a a piece an extract from an ABC piece Mm. Jamal not his real name fled the Taliban for safety in Australia but he said it was Australia's ongoing and indefinite detention that had left him permanently scarred the refugee known as Jamal described the anguish that led him to a drastic act setting himself on fire while in detention on the Pacific Island of Nauru. I got third degree burn injuries, it's deep scars and it will stay for my lifetime, he told the ABC. In mid-2013, the Rudd government declared that no asylum seeker who arrived in Australia by boat would ever be resettled in Australia, even if they were found to be a refugee. That policy has been continued by the current government, which refugee rights groups said was leaving people like Jamal in limbo for eight and a half years. Mm. He's being held in the Park Hotel in Melbourne's inner north, where tennis star Novak Djokovic was recently kept in immigration detention before a judge quashed the cancellation of his visa. At the hotel, Jamal and several others contracted COVID-19 in October last year. His lawyer, Alison Batterson, worked to extract 110 people from Afghanistan when Kabul fell to the Taliban last year. She said that was a simpler process than trying to free her client. It is mind-blowing when you make that comparison, that it was easier to escape the Taliban than it is to be released from an Australian immigration detention centre. Yeah. So you've got people in these kind of hotels and in other and in immigration detention centres as well who have been there for yes nine years. They've been there since they were children. They've committed absolutely no crime, yeah. and they've been recognised as refugees. They've yeah. had their claims accepted. These are people who are fleeing persecution. We owe them protection under international law, uh, but we've said that you cannot possibly be resettled in this country, and so you're just in this insane fucking limbo for a very long time. Conditions at the Park Hotel are extreme. The men are free to leave their rooms, but not the hotel. There is little fresh air. There are reports in December that meals have been contaminated with maggots. It's fucking brutal and horrific. Yeah. And there has been this attention, this media interest in the plight of these people seeking asylum while the attention has been on Novak at the same time. 
Do you think that's a good thing, a political opportunity? Is it cutting through? What do you think? Yeah, like, and I think that because I saw quite a few folks on the left kind of focusing their attention on people who were maybe just now interested in, in you know, immigrants' rights or, or the rights of asylum seekers and, and the conditions of, of facilities like this. Mm. Um, and I think certainly like only being interested in those conditions when they apply to a wealthy tennis player is cooked but yes. <laughs> there were people who were saying I'd never thought about the conditions of, of these refugees until Djokovic was um was in there yeah and then people saying well that you know having a go at them and and the fact that they'd been ignorant and that is something that really pisses me off when it's like yeah that, that you're trying to get someone to to understand something and to care about something but then as soon as they do they haven't understood it in the right way or yeah. they haven't understood it quickly enough and like they're an idiot and they should have understood it sooner it's like no any kind of you know avenue into radicalization or politicization i think is a positive thing mm. and it also yeah i do think that shining a light on these atrocities is important and if it weren't the government wouldn't, wouldn't go to such great lengths to keep this behind closed doors i remember I, I guess it was last year or maybe even the year before but when there were sustained blockades and, and camps outside of these um these hotels where refugees were being held um, medivac refugees mm. and in in brisbane they would do things like for example close off the balconies so that the refugees the men could no longer come out and and speak to people or, or wave to people or hold signs yeah. because that was creating this vision that actually was you know useful for, for for media and kind of capturing the public attention um they wouldn't allow you know they wouldn't allow us to to do things like give them give them food but particularly yeah they were shutting them away from the public because that was something to actually see someone's face yeah. who has been shut inside one of these facilities for eight years or so for absolutely no crime to see their wife and children standing outside of the gate you know speaking up to them through a microphone or through a phone just begging to be able to to hug their their husband or or their father like that is what the government does not want you to see that is a result of their cruel asylum seeker regime mm. it's actually been remarkable there was a campaign a couple of years ago to try and take away um uh people detainees phones right like the, yeah. like the government's yeah. trying to pull some bullshit national security nonsense or that some of these people are pedophiles like just fucking gross racist shit to take away phones which are a lifeline from people in detention to the outside world you know something that really makes a huge difference for their mental health and just you know, their, their ability to mm. hang on to their humanity while they're trapped in these in these detention centers and they lost that appeal and they got to hang on to their phones and then ever since too it's pretty remarkable you're seeing people who are detained Doing Zoom interviews, you know, there were the, Mehdi yeah. Ali, who um, is uh, came to Australia when he's fifteen, has been detained ever since then. Just turned twenty four, so he's been there for nine fucking years. He's on international media, right, giving interviews about his experience. We can see people's faces, we can hear their names, and one would hope that 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 stuff does cut through because, unfortunately, the way public opinion works isn't perhaps the way we would like it to. Yeah, and you need. You need cute faces. You need individual stories. You need sympathetic cases to to certainly get me the kind of media coverage that you want and to try and cut through and, and make a bit of an impact. Now, there are some people in the refugee rights movement who really despise that and want to push back against that and say that, you know, human rights is for everyone and mm. even if you're a young man who could might intimidate some people in middle white Australia with your appearance and your age and might be perceived as a threat, you know, obviously you don't deserve to be detained indefinitely either. You have human rights as well. But, you know, again, one would say that you probably have to take the win if people's attention are turning to this stuff and calling it out, even if it's, even if it's via Novak Djokovic. That's that's probably a good thing, and, and hopefully yeah, we can use it's that. It's not the be all and end, all. like it's not the answer to the to the problem, but I think we can learn from it. Yeah, and yeah, I'm not going to be turning away people from from the movement, sure, because uh, they've come through this. And you know, the Greens, bunch of the Greens folks were were doing that. Um, Steph Hodgins May, the candidate for McNamara, did a um, event on Twitter Spaces with Baruz Bachani. Mm. I did not join. I refused to understand what Twitter Spaces is or what the fuck they were. Doing. Yes, <laughs> the, I will not the fuck click they were. The little logo that they keep telling me to click. <laughs> but you know, again, I, in in very crude political terms, an opportunity for the Greens to make a lot of noise about this, remind people that this is the kind of thing that we're fighting for. Another key difference between us and the other so-called Progressive Party, Labor, because Labor introduced mandatory detention under the Keating government and has maintained his support for offshore detention. 
say they're opposed to indefinite detention. They say, oh, detentions, you know, we need it, but it shouldn't go on for years and years and years. But of course, we'll refuse to back any kind of limit on detention, mm. whereas the Greens have announced a policy of a seven-day limit on detention, increasing our humanitarian impact uh, intake. And that's onshore. Onshore, yeah. yes. Um, yes, exactly. Shutting down, closing the camps, absolutely, 100%. Yeah. Um, yes, guaranteeing human rights of people, working on a regional solution with our neighbours so that you can actually stop people getting on boats and taking those dangerous journeys while also guaranteeing them dignity and safety and protecting their human rights. Uh, and, of course, having a Royal Commission into Australia's detention regime. We all, we all love Royal yeah, Commissions, right? the mandatory <laughs> final dot point of, of every webpage of the Australian <laughs> Greens. <laughs> so, look, I'm, uh, I'm sure we're not telling you stuff you don't already know. The Greens are way better on refugee rights and, you know, uh, the cynical part of me says that Novak Djokovic's story will end and... Folks will move on with their lives and if this becomes an election issue, it will be in a very bad way and the Morrison government will try to pull some you know, strong borders bullshit that we need to fight against and Labor will not take on that fight because they're not interested in it. Yeah, I think but I did just want to read, you know, there was a, a little bit in a, a piece by John O'Shree, the Greens councillor in Brisbane, um, about COVID and, and COVID regulations in general, but there's one piece where he talks about how this has made us think about borders that I think is relevant to this. Um, and I'll just read it out. So he says, I think one of the tipping points for me was when a whole bunch of comparatively privileged people started complaining that their travel and ability to cross borders would be limited on the basis of their status and a piece of paper. This is talking about vaccines. I mean, that is literally what passports and national border controls have always been designed to do. If you think it's unjustified discrimination to prevent people from entering a country or crossing a border on grounds that you consider arbitrary, are you also opposed to restricting people's movement based on their nationality and age, which Australia does routinely? Mm. It seems to me that philosophically speaking, it's difficult for anti-mandate protesters to sustain the argument that border controls based on vaccination status are wrong, but border controls based on other characteristics like where someone was born or how much money they have are right. I guess this means a lot more people are joining the struggle against racist nationalism and border imperialism. If that's you, <laughs> welcome aboard. <laughs> welcome aboard. Toot, toot. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. We begin with breaking news. The Immigration Minister has just cancelled the visa of world number one Novak Djokovic. What do you think of the, the Hillsong stuff? Because as we're recording, this is the morning where everyone is freaking out about the fact that Hillsong um, had this massive, I mean, it really is, it's like a festival and everyone's singing and dancing and doing all the things that other people can't do mm -hmm. um, because they can have a religious exemption. Oh, they, they, there is actually an exemption for them. Is that right? Oh, I thought so. Holy fuck. Well, I think it's fine because they're protected by the love of Jesus, so they'll be fine and nothing can break that, not even corona, the novel coronavirus. My understanding was that, yes, they did change the exemption to, to just include music festivals or something like that. Like They changed the language. They didn't say, hey, Hillsong's fine, but they put the restriction in such a way that, uh, they the Hillsong themselves could interpret it to say that um, that they're exempt. Is that accurate? Well, okay, hang on. I just looked it up, and apparently, police have ruled out any fine for the COVID breach. <laughs> so that's cool. We love that's so the good. police, um, which everyone is going to fucking lose their mind about because it is again <laughs> like it's like the Djokovic thing. It's the same. It's like this double standard that infuriates people, but also people just even before the double standard is applied, people love finding someone to hate and who is a better target, particularly in the context of our, our Prime Minister being, you know, Pentecostalist. Pente yes. Pentecost Pentecostalist. Pentecostal, yes. Pentecostalist. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, like who who better to hate than singing and dancing Christians? It is fun. Like it is it is pretty fun. But it's kind of cringe because it brings out, I, I kind of also hate the like hyper anti-theist leftists online, the boomers who are like, well, actually, I read the Bible. and <laughs> <laughs> Here are my notes. Yes, well, you, you're uh, talking to someone who was quite a passionate new atheist for quite yeah. a while, and I do hope I've chilled out a little bit and I'm a little less of a dick, but I was on the Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris train for quite a while there, I'm, I'm sorry to say. But, um, look, it is frustrating. People hate Hillsong for a range of reasons, you know, the music, uh, but also the fact they don't pay taxes, they're, they're part of the um, prosperity gospel shit, and, you know, the child abuse and the covering up therein and the close relationship to the Prime Minister. Now, I agree. We should. We are a nation of cops and we should resist that at every possible opportunity that we have. But, yes, the double standard stuff do, does drive people furious. And if you look at what's happening in the UK at the moment, like it's bonkers, okay? The Tory party in power, it's all coming out now. Someone is ingeniously leaking against Boris Johnson. 
and bringing out all this evidence of various events and parties that Tories had at Number 10 Downing Street uh, while the rest of the country was in lockdown. And that's particularly galling because these are the people who are fucking making the rules, right? They're making Mm -hmm. up the rules, imposing them on everybody's life for public health reasons and for good reason. Um, And, you know, it's just been a PR disaster for the Tories because you've just got people saying, my mother died alone yeah. while you were having your little fucking party, right? Like it's it's pretty brutal and it cuts through. Um, and, I mean, my personal opinion is the singing and dancing thing is pretty fucking stupid to begin with. So <laughs> it's, it's like, okay, this is a stupid law that we all have to abide by, but we get an exception for for young Christians who are, like, passionate about Jesus. Incredibly annoying, incredibly annoying. <laughs> but it's also like, is this just another one of those things where, I we have this fervent hope that maybe this will be the thing that um, raises class consciousness in people. Like it's almost like the hope that we had at the beginning of the pandemic that it would like radicalize everyone and we would like restructure the economy and society. Um, and, and all it ends up being is like that meme that's just the perfect encapsulation of Australia, where it's like Australia and it's the one you know the guy looking at at the hot girl behind him while his girlfriend is like, "Why are you looking at her?" And he's just looking at. The thing that says more cops and then his girlfriend is like any other solution. Then it's like, yeah, the answer is always just going to be more cops. So instead of us being like, hmm, maybe this points to a fundamental disparity in in society when it comes to like wealth and power and certain political or or religious or economic structures are afforded these particular Mm. privileges that ordinary folks, ordinary working people and particularly people of color don't get. Maybe we need to do something about that structure and that system. Instead, it's like, no, we've been policed. We've been oppressed. They need to be policed and oppressed harder. (laughs) Yes, that's a good point. It is a very, again, centrist, liberal, small L liberal appeal, isn't it? Always like citing the rules. Very reactionary. Here's the manual. And I'd like to speak to the manager because you didn't uh, sort that out. And, of course, yes, if you have a materialist analysis, something closer to, you know, a Marxist class analysis, you say, well, you can have all the rules you want. They're not going to apply to everybody equally because- (laughs) <laughs> because money because and because money. capitalism. Yeah. And that's the way that, that the deal works. And even if even if you pass laws and all these restrictions and, and guidance, right, that in theory apply to everybody universally, when someone fucks up, if they're rich and powerful enough, they will find a way to get around it and the exem- they'll get the exception and the exemption and they'll they'll be um patted on the head or maybe yeah. publicly scolded but let off. There is one rule I would like to apply to everyone though, which is that no one is allowed to make any more of those fucking cringe annoying tweets that are like a call back to creating fake religions like pastafarianism where they're like, well, maybe I'm going to start jerking off and call it a religion <laughs> and then I'll be allowed to jerk off on people or whatever they fucking want. Like, please, please don't make that joke anymore. That's all I ask. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's probably fair. Oh man, I'll send you a, a speech I gave at the um, the Atheist Foundation convention from 2012. Oh, is that what we're listening to next week? I want to punch myself in the face watching it. All right, that's um, what we're doing next no next week, folks. Tune in <laughs> next week on Serious Danger to hear Tom's absolutely cringe speech. On the upside, you know, with all these people getting away with certain stuff, just remember that at the end of the day, the ultimate judgment is in the hands of of the Lord and we will mm. all be judged equally, rich and poor you make a good point. Uh, alike, and uh, we'll be judged for all our decisions and choices. So if, you, if you're happy with that, if you can look the Lord in the eye and be happy with ev- all the choices that you've made, Emerald Moon, then good luck to you. Uh, well, we're both probably going to hell. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, yes, Saturday night at the Atheist Convention. <laughs> If someone tells you they're religious and they love God and they love Jesus, I say that is awesome, that is great, I totally respect that. Hey, you want to buy some of these magic beans? <laughs> All right, this week's guest, we've got another stellar Greens candidate for you. Celeste Little is a proud Arente woman, trade unionist, writer, First Nations activist, and the candidate for Cooper, formerly known as Batman in Melbourne's Inner North. It's one of the most progressive seats in the country. For a long time was an ALP stronghold until the Greens came along and fucked it up and made it a marginal seat a few years back, currently held by Jed Carney and a real chance for the Greens with a fantastic candidate like Celeste. Hello, Celeste. Thanks very much for uh, being on Serious Danger. Thanks for having me on, folks. It's good to see you. <laughs> you too. Um, I just wanted to start in, the, in your pinned tweet. Uh, people should follow you on Twitter at Utopiana. You write, I said I would never consider a career in politics. I still am not someone who considers politician to be a career. I very much think change happens at the grassroots and on the streets. Yes. If that is the case, why are you selling out, Celeste? Why are you <laughs> getting part of the system, man, and running to oh. become a dirty, dirty MP? 
Oh, look, you know, it's <laughs> kind of, um, there isn't one main reason. There's a couple of reasons. So, so I think the first is during the pandemic, during COVID, I became incredibly aware, I guess, for the first time, which sounds incredibly naive for a middle-aged, um, middle-aged black woman, this community, which is, as you said, not one of the most progressive seats in the country. It actually is the most progressive voting seat in the country. This is right. the kind of seat where the Liberal Party doesn't even bother turning up to some booths to hand out how to vote cards because mm-hmm. there's no point. Mm. Um, they don't get a look in. So the the democratic choice for residents of Cooper needs to be on the left so that people actually do feel that they have a democratic choice and that their voices are heard no matter what they choose. Mm. And the Labor Party itself needs to be pressured a bit from the left, I believe, because they've been playing to the centre and indeed to the right. No, no, that's <laughs> wrong, actually, Celeste. That, well, <laughs> that's incorrect, right? Emerald, like Celeste doesn't know yeah. what she's talking about. She's actually, she's <laughs> actually being evil by running against a progressive Labor woman, <laughs> and you know, making it easier for the Libs to win. Don't you realise oh, this? My goodness. <laughs> yeah. Well, if I didn't realise that, I realised that after three weeks of online. Yeah. Pounding from from various people who I would have thought should have known a little bit more about democracy and the right to democratic choice and mm. people that call themselves feminists or um, you know or union activists or whatever other sort of type of activists piling onto an indigenous woman for having the hide to run against um, a progressive labor woman. Well, as a woman, as a feminist, <laughs> how could you run against a progressive labor woman, you know? And also telling me to run elsewhere. I think that mm. one of the reasons why I did choose to to run with the Greens is that we run in the communities that we actually live in, you know, with the people that we represent. I'm not some sort of stellar candidate who who has been helicoptered into a seat to cause a ruckus. Well, I'm to an, be clear, you are a stellar candidate. But. You're a stellar candidate, yes. <laughs> no, I, I don't know about that. But, <laughs> I, you know, I... My pre-selection was by me putting my hand up. You know, Mm. I got asked if I'd be interested. So I thought about it for a few months and then decided, okay, look, I'll give this a shot. Well, just to be clear, when you were announced in May 2021, Victorian Labor MP Martin Bakula tweeted, yep, the Greens are going to fight back against the Liberals and advocate for working people by throwing everything they have at trying to knock Jed Carney, someone who's actually spent her entire working life doing those things, out of Parliament. Right on, you champions. And for folks who don't know, Jed Carney was a former secretary or president of the ACTU, the Australian Council of Trade Unions. President of the ACTU. President, there you go. Okay. And then this sort of came up again this past week. There was a big profile in the Australian newspaper about Max Chandler Mather, the Greens candidate in Griffith, about this massive uh, door knocking campaign, this people powered grassroots campaign that the Greens have mounted to win Griffith's already overtaken Adam Band's campaign to try and take Melbourne back in 2010, like a really massive people-powered campaign. They're getting people on, out of the streets talking about Greens policies. And Tanya Plibersek tweeted out that article with the with her thoughts saying, every moment spent campaigning against progressive Labor women MPs, he's campaigning against uh, Terry Butler, the shadow environmental minister, makes it easier for Scott Morrison to remain prime minister. And this is something we see again and again. The Greens uh, should never run against uh, any Labor MP, apparently, because we're just helping out the Liberals and particularly not progressive Labor women, for goodness sakes, because Mm. they're progressive and they're women and you're allowed to disturb their hold on power. And I know this only really concerns probably politicos, people who are paying close attention to the ins and outs of Ozpol and on Twitter, but it really does seem to give the impression that Labor thinks they deserve these seats, that I assume mm-hmm. they want to run completely unopposed and cannot possibly be challenged from the left because they're the Labor Party and they're progressive Labor women, even if they're bound by Labor policy, which a lot of the time is fucking dog shit. Not progressive at all. At all. But firstly, to Emerald, I'd love to hear from you. Like, how, how do you, I, I assume you've come up against this uh, all the time as a former candidate yourself and working on um, campaigns for Greens running against Labor MPs. How do you respond to this? Should we actually care about it or should we just dismiss it as the bad faith argument that it is? Oh, it's absolutely bad faith, but it is like, it's interesting because there's the totally bad faith argument from Labor that says that is, yeah, basically uh, it's predicated on the assumption that they have some sort of innate right to the seat a lot of the time, like we saw it in Queensland when 
you know, Amy McMahon for the Greens won the seat from Jackie Trad. They're kind of so-called like progressive left hero, but they are so angry at her, like as though she stole the seat when, you know, she was voted in the same as, as anyone else. It's so easy to tear down that argument. I think there are people within the Greens who fall for that to some extent or who have this argument that sits under that where they think that we feed too much money and too much resources into labor seats and we should be focusing all of our like all of our funding and and resources and everything on liberal seats because it's more important that we kick out libs. But I feel like that kind of, it it misses the point that it's like, we we should focus where we can win, right? Mm. Yeah, I have so many thoughts about this. So mm. um, Martin Pakula really showed his ass when he <laughs> tweeted that. It was hilarious. It was incredibly wrong. It was ridiculous. Like when, when the Greens released the idea for the crossbench, and that was back in March um, 2020 when when that was hitting the news, Cooper wasn't a target seat. Um, mm. So the idea, like the idea that heaps of resources are being thrown at this seat in order to unseat a progressive um, Labor woman is just not correct. I am the resource. Me and me and the incredible <laughs> campaign team and yeah. the volunteers that we have. So it is completely grassroots. Do Labor think that they own this seat? Absolutely they do. Um, mm-hmm. Apart from a short time in the late 60s and then at the very beginning of the seat, Labor have held it and they've held it for incredible margins. Like, you know, I think it was 26% at one point. It, it's been for years one of the safest Labor seats in the country, so they do believe they own it. Yeah. That whole idea of democracy and democratic choice, it just doesn't seem to play out in those sorts of arguments. Like we're running for House of Representative seats here. Mm. So therefore those seats are divvied up via suburbs and postcodes and whatever sort of arbitrary boundaries that the Electoral Commission sets. And um, the representative part is, to me, says representative of that community you know it's it's not the the idea that we should be running elsewhere you know, apart from the communities that we live in um as greens people just makes absolutely no sense to me it's mm. sort of you know these these are our communities so so our communities deserve the right to have a choice where they live who represents them but also too you know it, it is such a furphy like the greens run in nearly every seat cross country mm-hmm. so we are running against liberals exactly mm. we are running against labor people we are running against independents that are popular we're running everywhere to give people that choice Right. Because that's why we, even when it's hard to find a candidate, we will search for someone because we want people to have a choice to vote for our platform, which to be clear is not the platform of Labor. Like it's very different. <laughs> yeah. Yes. If it were the same platform, we wouldn't bother. Yeah. Exactly. And this this is surely at the heart of the Labor argument, right? There is no real choice. Hey, we're all progressive. We're all supposed to be on the same team. Therefore, you shouldn't run against us because that just splits resources. Like, well, no. Yeah. Well, one party is... Uh, has just caved on tax cuts for the rich and the, and the Buffett rule. Uh, that's Labor, by the way. <laughs> Labor's come out as pro-coal, <laughs> now explicitly pro-coal, mm-hmm. and refuses to wind down the fossil fuel industry while there's still demand out there. Anthony Albanese is out there in uh, Queensland sort of saying we are on board coal uh, as long as there's demand for it. Tax cuts for the rich, political donations from um, fossil fuel industry and corporate political donations, and on the question of people seeking asylum and refugee rights, there is a substantial difference. I know Jed Carney is very outspoken and has been in the past about refugee rights, but at the end of the day, she will vote with her party, which thinks that the indefinite mandatory detention of people seeking asylum and contravention of their human rights and international law is the way to go. And they've refused to take on that fight and push back against the fortress Australia regime. Mm -hmm. So there is clearly a whole lot of room to the left of the Labor Party that the Greens occupy. And I'm sorry, if you're not into campaigning for the seat that you have and taking place in the battle of ideas and trying to change people's minds and prove to voters that they deserve, you deserve their vote, get the fuck out of politics, you know? Absolutely. Mm. Maybe we can kind of shift direction a little bit here. Before we finish up, wanted to talk about this kind of, this phenomenon probably been happening maybe by stealth over the last, you know, year or six months even and coming to the fore, I think, with the um, the fires at Old Parliament House recently. The infiltration of First Nations groups and, and communities by um, conspiracy theory groups, so 
predominantly like sovereign citizens and folks who have links to to QAnon and a lot of the time yeah linked with anti-vax and and all this kind of broad tent conspiracy theories. I'm keen to get your take on this because I my view is that it looks like you know these groups are quite cynically infiltrating communities to use black folks as almost a shield against criticism, particularly from the left. And I think it is sometimes an effective wedge on the left. And we saw that with the confusion around the fire at Old Parliament House. Like, what do you think? I think it's incredibly complicated. So mm. so what we're seeing play out is, you know, the Indigenous sovereignty movement, which is based on, you know, ancestral ties, based mm. on land rights, based on the fact that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people never ceded their sovereignty to the Crown. So, you know, we are a pre-treaty country um, yeah. and that wrong won't be rectified until we've, we've addressed that. That combined with arguments of, of individual sovereignty and the rights of sovereign people as a sovereign, you know, sort of body mm. to reject infringements upon civil liberties and the whole sort of anti-vax movement and how they've, how they've been able to grab onto the individual sovereignty thing, try and combine it yeah. with the Indigenous sovereignty movement and cause a bit of a mishmash of ideas there. You know, you can see how that arises when, and I've written articles about this, when um, a lot of the pandemic response, rather than being about boosting public health and social safety nets and public housing and so on and so forth, has been about policing communities and um, yeah. and having huge fines for people. And when um, the stats are showing that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are being targeted, you can you can kind of see why there's a section yeah. of the community that will fight back against that. There's also a history, and I think Naoka Gori wrote a magnificent article about this, yeah. which talked about the history of lock hospitals and Aboriginal people being medically tested upon. Mm-hmm. It talked about the biological warfare, such as, you know, smallpox running rampant through through communities as a way of committing genocide. And there being a distrust in an Indigenous distrust in governments. And yeah. when they do mandate things like vaccines, there is a distrust that comes back. However, all that aside, I'm really (laughs) unpacking this. Um, No, it's important. All that aside, the reason why the tent embassy still exists is because land rights doesn't exist yet. You know, we still haven't had our sovereignty as as First Nations people properly recognised by so-called Australia. That that fight is ongoing, as Gary Foley says, um, native title is not land rights, you know. Mm. And what we're seeing at Parliament House with this sort of group coming in and infiltrating what is a long-standing, you know, ongoing monument to the land rights and sovereignty movement, the people, the the um the tent embassy people themselves and the traditional owners of Canberra, so-called Canberra, have both put out statements denouncing the actions of these other groups that are coming in, particularly when we're looking um, this year is the 50th anniversary of the tent embassy, particularly when, you know, one of their actions was to burn down or burn the front doors of um, Old Parliament House. Mm-hmm. And due to due to um, an occupation that happened in Old Parliament House in the early 90s, um, which involved a lot of Aboriginal activists, including um, Uncle Charlie Perkins, The Old Parliament House has actually become a place that contains a lot of the archives of the history of the Tent Embassy and is therefore, you know, quite important. You've got the Mm. Museum of Democracy and then this juxtaposition with the Tent Embassy. So, yeah, I, I find it's really troubling and I'm deeply concerned considering that we don't have land rights yet. Um, you know, there is no treaties Mm. that, um, that an anniversary such as the 50th anniversary of the tent embassy could potentially be hijacked by a bunch of people who are playing quite a different argument. Yes, quite quite a different argument. I'll, I'll put this in the, in the show notes too. Uh, there's a great piece from Jack Lettermore that yeah. really gives you a lowdown of exactly how these groups relate to the, the tent embassy and other um, First Nations movements for justice. I did not realise this, and just really quickly, this is a quote from that piece. 
Uh, a series of virtual meetings between prominent Indigenous group members and non-Indigenous alt-right activists suggest a plot to effectively copy the US Capitol Hill insurrection. Yeah. For the Australian version, the target is Old Parliament House. They believe the quasi-mystical locus of power in Australia is vested in the seat of the Old Parliament House because that is the address listed on the ABN registrations of the Commonwealth's Economy and Trade Departments. The new Parliament House, the seat of federal government since 1988, is pretend, they say, and the government's jurisdiction fiction. Okay, so there's this kind of like yeah. mystical location all based around Old Parliament well, House, which has no influence or power whatsoever anymore, and that's no. sort of like why it's the focus of their burning burning shit down i mean this is just like that's how sovereign citizen stuff it's just like hyper bush lawyering <laughs> um you know like reading the constitution being like i think this but yes. yeah it's like all conspiracy theories it plays on very real fears and very mm. real you know historical anxieties that have a basis in 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 class and and race and and everything like that um but i think that ultimately I, I'm worried about the effective wedge that it can have on the Greens. I think that the Greens are, have lost a few like First Nations members and and people from the movement to to this sovereign citizen kind of this conspiracy theory incursion, which to be clear does not come from yeah First Nations people. Like it it's some people you know First Nations people involved now, but that's not its origin. Yeah. Um, so I think it's I, I guess as you say, Celeste, it's remembering exactly you know what do we support? What was this initially formed to fight for? To fight for sovereignty? To fight for land rights? And that's I guess where Greens people and particularly you know non Indigenous Greens folks like ourselves, Tom and I, allies who who want to kind of be there for First Nations folks, just remember exactly what we're what we're fighting for and, and stand by them in that. Yeah, yeah. I'm wondering if that dude like that. Chimiroquai lookalike dude's going to rock up to this version of it because that was something else. Um, well, that I can get know. on board. He's got some great shoots. Um, <laughs> look, we're, we're out of time. I'm sorry, Celeste. We could keep talking to you for a very long time, but um, people can obviously – help you out and support the campaign for Cooper. We want to turn Cooper green. We can totally do it. And we've got a fantastic candidate in you. So people should definitely check out your website and um, volunteer and help out where they can uh, to help turn Cooper green. Is there anything in particular coming up that you want to plug or, or mention that people can um, get involved with if they want to help you out? Look, the main thing I think that we need right now is is more volunteers. We, we did have things planned, but but COVID, <laughs> oh, you know, so so um, we're currently re-looking at some of the events and activities that we we're going to be running as um as fundraisers, as community building sort of exercises. But I think that if people want to keep abreast of what's coming up, the best way to do that is probably to jump on my Greens website, which is little. L I double D L A dot greens dot org dot au and just um you know chuck the details in the volunteer thing the volunteer section someone will contact you um and you can volunteer for everything from hosting a placard to to being involved in door knocks and leafleting to events there's a lot of opportunities there um. We're just hoping to get some really exciting stuff off the ground because the one thing that um, I did forget to say about this seat is that it's an incredibly wonderful multicultural and creative seat. So there's so many things that we want to celebrate in this mm. campaign. We'd love more people on the ground ready to roll when we're actually able to and when we don't have this dark cloud of, of virus hanging over our heads. That'd be nice. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Thanks, Les Little. Lovely to hang out Thank with you. you so and much. Um, yeah, all the best, comrade. Solidarity. No worries. Thank you. See you when you make it to Parliament. Hi, I'm Christopher Pine, and welcome to Pine Time. My guest today is Jackie Trad. So, with Gladys and the ICAC in New South Wales, I felt very sad mm. for Gladys. It just seemed like incredible timing. <laughs> Hey, that's pretty much our show this week, everybody. Thank you for listening, as always. Uh, we have a call to action, something that you can do um, uh, considering the events of this week and what we discussed on the show. Huge shout out to the Refugee Action Collective. Uh, there are chapters across the country, but in Victoria, it's rac-vic.org. They uh, have been just you know, endlessly supportive of people in detention and have been making the calls for justice, organising rallies for years and years and years. They are having an action on Monday, 17th of January. That is tomorrow, if you listen to this on the day it comes out, 11am at Birang Ma 
in Melbourne. That is a rally for refugees. They're saying, hey, Jovex released, now free the refugees, okay? He'll be fine. He's a millionaire tennis player. <laughs> Think about those people who are trapped inside. So it's based around the Australian Open. Uh, go to their website and uh, you'll find out more details about that. Also, Rise Refugees, fantastic. That is all led by ex-detainees and refugees and people seeking asylum. They do fantastic work. And I know it's a very small thing, but if you want to you know, hear more from people directly, you know, the people who are living this shit, Mehdi Ali is on Twitter at Mehdi Ali 98 because that's the year he was born for fuck's sake. Fuck. But he's, you know, doing a lot of media out there and I think is a really articulate advocate for, for people who are detained and who has been putting up with the bullshit that our government imposes on them for a very, very long time. So check him out at Mehdi Ali 98. All that stuff is in the show notes. And another reminder as well, like we mentioned at the start of the show, we're going to do an AMA, Ask Us Anything, next week. We'll dedicate a bit of a time to kind of talk about what you guys want us to talk about. Any questions that you have, please send them to us. Um, shoot us a DM. We're on Twitter and Instagram at SeriousDangerAU or you can email us at hello at SeriousDangerPod.com. Do it, y'all. Do it. Serious Danger is produced by Mikey Mike Griffin, a wonderful producer, and made possible with the help of the Green Institute. You can rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening. Or, yeah, reach out on social media at Serious Danger AU. Check us out on Patreon, too, if you've got some spare cash to help us cover the costs of making this thing. All the details at SeriousDangerPod.com. Thank you, dear Emerald. Goodbye. We love you. We love yous. Bye. Bye. Serious Danger Australia. Mmm, delicious content.